We want to welcome everyone. It is good to see you this morning. It's a tad bit warmer than it was last Sunday, and so we hope you're enjoying the nicer weather, but we're enjoying your presence with us today. Whether you're here in the auditorium or joining us through live stream, we're glad that you are here. We do know we have guests worshiping with us, and we're happy that you're here. If you are a guest, we just ask that you fill out the little tear-off that's on your bulletin. It has room for some information about you, and if you wouldn't mind completing that, placing it in the offering plate later on in the service, and that way we'll have a record of your attendance today. But it is so good to see you here. By way of other announcements, uh, you see we'll be having choir today at 4. The nominating committee that was going to meet today will not be meeting. Well, I believe that's going to be next Sunday at 3.30. So if you're on the nominating committee, take note of that. Um, you see we're still in our January Bible study. You can still get plugged into that, any of it. The children are working on their musical to present the second Sunday of February. So if you've got kids, make sure they're here tonight. The Bible drillers are working. And Sharon's meeting with the youth. So there's something for everyone tonight as well you see other activities and events taking place this week and just be in prayer for the things and the ministries we have at church and the things that are going on as well also if you'll look at the prayer request those who are sick at home are in the hospital in need of prayer and then our missionaries celebrating birthdays today but as we begin our service let's just go to the lord now in a time of intercessory prayer Good morning. We're glad that each of you are here this morning as we share in this special uh, day of uh, honoring men and encouraging men to be all that God wants them to be. And uh, Baptist Men's Day is what we've called it. We uh, had an excellent breakfast this morning. Appreciate the guys that did the cooking. And Hollis Conway was with us then. He'll be our speaker for this morning. But it's our tremendous privilege to be able to uh, begin our service with baptism this morning as uh, Isaac Mayfield made public his profession of faith last week, and we come to this special time in his life today. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we cannot thank you enough for life itself, for the privilege that we have of being able to, to have a personal relationship with you, to be able to walk with you daily in life. And I pray that as we worship this morning, we'll be lifting our voices in praise and thanksgiving to you, and we'll also be listening to that still, small voice of yours to speak to our hearts. 
and we'll do that which you would have us to do. Because, Lord, we know that, that we're here just for a, a short time, really, when you consider all of history. But you, you've given us a purpose, and we want to fulfill that purpose. And I trust that we'll be sensitive to your leadership daily and be willing to let you give us the strength to do that which you want us to do. Even now, as we come to this baptismal time, I pray that it will be not only special in the life of Isaac, but also be an opportunity to remind each of us who have already trusted you and have been baptized of that moment when we too uh, walk this way. It'll be a reminder of that time when we first started that walk, and it'll be an encouragement to us to truly be growing daily in our relation with you. For we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. amen. I always like to remind us when we come to this time of baptism that that the baptismal service, baptism doesn't save anybody. It's an opportunity to, to show forth what God's already done. First of all, what he did in making possible our salvation. For he came to this world, he died on that cross, was buried, and three days later he rose from the grave. And that death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord was all for us. It was to pay the price of our sins and to show the power that he had over uh, death and over Satan and everything that he would hold over our heads. And he would be able to say to us, you can trust me and walk with me and follow me. And as we do that, as we commit our lives to him, then that's the picture of baptism is what happens in our life. We die to the old self. It's buried in baptism and raised to a new life in Christ. Again, it's only showing forth what's already happened in the individual's life. But it's in obedience to what God's asked us to do that we do it. And that's why I always say as a part of the, the, what I say just before baptizing them, that it's in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And because of that person's commitment to Jesus, their, their profession of faith, that I now can baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So that's why I say what I do. Because that's exactly what it's all about. He's commanded us to do it when we've committed our life to him. And then we have that opportunity to share in that with Isaac. So Isaac, if you'll come on into the water now. Isaac Mayfield. Isaac, you've got a very special name. It's a Bible name. You know that, I'm sure. Step up just a little bit. The son of promise. That's what Isaac means. I hope you'll live up to that name. Abraham and Sarah waited a long time for their Isaac to be born. But uh, he had a special place to fulfill in God's plan. And God has a special plan for your life too. And our prayers will be with you that, that God is just going to walk with you daily and help you fulfill that purpose in your life. And it is because of the profession of faith that you've made in him. And as God has commanded us to do so, that I now can baptize you, Isaac Mayfield, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We rejoice with him. We truly rejoice. Gene Ford, would you lead us in prayer, please, sir? Our Father in heaven, as we uh, pause at this moment, Lord, we thank you that Jesus thought that children were so important that even when the disciples tried to run them away, he said, let the little children come to me. And so, Lord, now as Isaac has come and made his profession of faith, we just pray for him now, Lord, that he'll grow in knowledge and wisdom of you, that he also, Lord, will know that his church family is here to encourage him, to love him, and to guide him. And we thank you, Lord, that even on this men's day that we as men can stand up and be strong and be the men that we need to be to encourage our children and our young men. So, Lord, we thank you for this because we know the angels in heaven are rejoicing over this one that came to you and made a profession of faith. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning. It's good to see all of you. You know, we've come into his...
house and gathered in his name and in sing. Worship his majesty. Majesty. Worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom of God. And we do welcome you this morning, and we want you to turn and greet each other in the Lord's name and get to know somebody new during the time of welcome. It's a special day, and we're glad that you're here. God bless you. Just
fill our homes with your presence. You alone are worthy of our reverence. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Your presence, you alone are worthy of our reverence. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We Okay, good morning. I just want y'all to know, I'm going to share, you know, I don't brag a lot about all the wonderful things I have done in life, all my accomplishments. Thank you, Savannah. All my accomplishments and wow. achievements. But there's one thing I want to share with y'all. In 1988 and in 1992, I won the bronze and silver medals for the low jump. <laughs> low jump. Low jump. Not the high jump. I jumped lower than anybody else at the Olympics. That was not easy to do. Have you ever tried to jump lower than somebody else? Yes. No. It was fun. I didn't have to do a lot of training or practice or anything. I did have to dig a hole, though, so I could go lower than the others. See, that's where I got them. They just thought you were supposed to jump like it was. But I thought, well, the only way I can go lower is to dig a hole and walk down lower. See, that's how I won. And y'all know better than to believe that, don't you? Today we have somebody very special with us. We have Mr. Hollis Conway. And uh, I tell you what, first things first, I've got a video that, that I want to Miss Emily to show. And y'all bear with us, you know, sometimes switching back and forth. Y'all want to hit the lights? An American medalist. I apologize for the shorts. On his first attempt at seven eight three quarters, having struggled in some jumps before this, Hollis Conway clears on his first attempt at all time first world record. That's not all. That's not all. I apologize for those shorts also. <laughs> and that out. a world record on that one. American. American record. Mm -hmm. That still stands. <coughs> Here it is. Look at it. <laughs> <laughs> that was close, wasn't it? Okay, you can stop the video. It's you the can, shorts. That's the scene. Yeah. Okay, I have some questions <laughs> for Hollis. Tell us about some of the things that you have done, some of the things that you have accomplished in your high jump. Okay. That last jump was seven feet, 10 and a half inches. Inch and a half under your living room ceiling is the fourth highest jump in the world. 
and it's the American indoor record that I set in 1991. And so I still hold that. I have two Olympic medals. I was number one in the world uh, a couple of years. I was number one in the USA for seven years. And I won some collegiate championships and all Americans and, and a lot of good things in the high jump. Okay. How hard did you have to work to get this? Did it just, you woke up one morning and realized what when you jumped out of bed that you jumped unusually high or something? <laughs> no. Yeah. I had to work very, very hard for a very long time. The Olympics are four years apart, so I had really four years of training to go to the Olympics. And lots of times I worked uh, two times a day, six days a week, uh, running in the sun and, and running stadiums and jumping stairs and flying through the air. Well, no, not all of that. I had to work very hard. Very hard. What was the first time you ever jumped? What, in high school, junior high? In junior high, the how first time I jumped. Jump? Well, it wasn't how high I jumped. It was what happened after I jumped. I missed the mat, and I hit the ground, and I knocked the wind out of myself, and they had to carry me home. I was crying and sad. and uh, So the bar was about this high. Um, so I got better. I had to work really, really hard. That's why I went for the low jump. You went for the low jump. Doesn't hurt when you miss. You've had a lot of experience, and if you go online and, and Google him on YouTube, you can see a lot of things, and you've been to a lot of countries and a lot of competitions, and I'm sure met a lot of people. Out of everything that, that you have done in your life, what do you consider the greatest thing? That is awesome. I've, I've stood on the Olympic Stadium in front of the world. I've traveled to countries, and you know, at the end of all of those competitions, I come home and I just found that those things did not make me happy. They made me happy while I was doing them, but then it went away. And uh, the only thing that has completely fulfilled me and made me happy is when I met a man named Jesus. Um, it was something that told me who I am, let me know that I was special, that he loved me in spite of my athletic accomplishments, in spite of my failures. Um, it's the only relationship that's been uh, meaningful for me. Uh, so my relationship with Jesus Christ, I would absolutely have to say is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Okay, that is wonderful. Now, you. after saying that, Miss Emily, could you show us the second video? Uh oh. Now, y'all watch closely. This is amazing. Third in the world and I put uh, last year. shorts on under second my shorts. Second in the Olympic Games in '88. Could be the, could this be the gold medal? <gasps> He's gone. So Sotomayor, in fact. I'm crying. If we can uh, read this situation correctly, we'll have won the and competition now I'm without to be happy. even having to take his final attempt. The Cuban, in his first ever Olympic Games, becomes the Olympic champion. Hollis Conway will end up with the bronze medal. Tim Forsyth, one of the youngest high jump bronze medalists of all time. And we'll show it twice. I and know. Uh, of Poland, okay, Emily, bronze you can stop well. that one. And here's the bronze medal that you won because of that one. How did you feel? Sad. I was trying my best, and that jump would have given me the gold medal had I made it. But I didn't. I didn't make it. Was but that's life. I was going to say, did that make you feel like a complete failure in life? Oh, no. No, I've, I've, missed, I've missed thousands of jumps. But nobody ever... Uh, talks about the thousands of jumps I missed. They talk about the one I made. Um, success is built on the road of failure. You, you get up and you keep trying. And because uh, I never said you fail, I say sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. The opportunities to learn to get better. So I didn't make it that time, but I, I thought about what happened, why it didn't happen, I learned from it, and I got better. And that's what life is. It knocks you down, you get back up. Was there somebody in particular that helped you get through that? Lots of people. You know, my relationship with God. The Bible talks about God is there. He loves us, and that inspired me to keep going. I had a coach that understood that, hey, that's a process. Success is a process. I had friends that would encourage me. Uh, I had family members, church members. Um, success is not achieved by itself. It's a group of people. It's a community of people. It's family. It's friends. Um, but you, 
you cannot be truly successful until you have some some disappointments and failures and frustrations because that makes the journey worth it. Okay. There's a scripture in the Bible, second in Second Timothy four seven, it says, I fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Just think on that first jump that Hollis took back in junior high, the one where he hit the ground, knocked the wind out of him, and said, what if he'd have stopped then? What if he said, I can't do it? We wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today, probably. No, ma'am. You know, just think of the things that he wouldn't have experienced in life and the, the opportunity he would have had to share with people about Christ. So remember that when, when you're in school and you've done your best and you're taking a test and you still didn't make the grade you wanted or you didn't make the team or things just didn't work out like you wanted it to, that's not the end of the world. Remember, God is there with you, your family, your friends, to help you through that, learn from it, and move on. Right? Anything else you want to share with the kids? And your youth pastor, they're also there with you also. Yes. Never give up. God is always with you. He loves you when you're very good. He loves you when you're not so good. He will always love you. Just trust him, and everything else will work out. Okay. After we have the prayer, and Mr. Robbie's already started singing, I want y'all to stay here. I want to get a group picture of y'all with Hollis, okay? So y'all just stay up here. And then after church, if anybody wants a picture with him individually, and he might let you wear his medal. 38 cent a medal. No, I'm <laughs> you made me pay you $10. <laughs> But anyway, stay, and then after church, I'll have my camera if anybody wants a picture. But let's pray. God, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for the people you bring into our lives, God, that, that can share with us and teach us and that we can learn from the experiences they have. And we do thank you for Hollis. We thank you for his ministry and especially, Lord, for his love for you. And God, I pray for each of these children. Lord, I don't know what you have in store for them or... Or, or just what they're going to do in life. But, God, I just pray that whatever it is, God, that they'll do their best for you and follow your will and guidance every day. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God, give us Christian hope. Where the Bible is love and taught, homes where the Master's will is sought, homes crowned with beauty thy love hath brought. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian. Christian homes, homes where the Father is true and strong, homes that are free from the blight of wrong, homes that are us with love and song. God give us Christian homes. Our deacons come forward for the morning offering. We're certainly thankful for what God's blessed us with. Many of them are in the uh, 
the choir. So if some of you would uh, fill in for them down here. Sonny, can you come and some of the others of you? They're going to be singing during, the, during that time. So they're going <laughs> to, we'll need you in the choir today. <laughs> yes, if you don't mind. We'd like for you to be singing. Here come some others who will fill in. All righty. Right. <laughs> yeah, we want to keep all them up here. All right, let's bow together in prayers. We thank the Lord for what he's blessed us with and the privilege of being able to give a portion back to him. And would you lead us in prayer this morning, Farrell? Dear Lord, thank you for this chance to be together, to come together and hear your word. We ask your blessings this morning on Brother William and Mr. Hollis as he brings us a message today. We ask your prayers this morning. We send our prayers this morning for all those who are hurting. We ask that you bring comfort in their life, whether it's physical or emotional. Bless us now as we give back to you of just a little of what you've given us. Amen. And we thank you guys for filling the, the choir this morning. We are grateful for each of you being here today. I'm not going to give you an entire rundown of Hollis's life. That would take too much time. He was a boy gr who uh, grew up in Shreveport and uh, Louisiana homebred and, uh, and uh, was a student at ULL. Uh, that's where he uh, got his uh, graduate uh, undergraduate work. And then came to, uh, north, uh, to the northeast part of our state about 17 years ago, wasn't it? To be the head of our FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. 
and he's worked all over northeast Louisiana with, with middle schools, uh, high schools, and universities to uh, help those organizations and to speak to young people and to, to counsel with them and counsel with coaches and all kinds of things all over our state. Recently, though, he accepted a position back at ULL, and he's now the assistant athletic director of... Uh, there it is. Diversity, Leadership, and Education. You know, the longer your title, the shorter your salary. So, isn't that usually the way it works? You know, if any time they want to give somebody a promotion, that's in, in, in lieu of a salary usually. But anyway, uh, that's where he has gone. And, and the thing about it, when he first came to Monroe, our church was one of the first he spoke in. Uh, brand new in the area. And now as he's leaving, uh, we're probably one of the last he'll speak in. Many others will probably have him back too, though. But it was just interesting to me that we're on both ends of the scale and uh, been with him in prayer groups through the years and, and in other activities. Gene Ford is on the uh, board with the uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes and uh, has worked with him closely uh, as well. Many of you have known him through the school activities and other things, but uh, you've already heard a little bit. We're just going to turn him loose to let, him, uh, let God share through him now and to close as God leads. Thank you, Hollis, for being here. Darn his crown, or, he, or else he, uh, he either gets spoiled a lot or he does a lot of spoiling. I'm not sure which. <laughs> good morning. I was going to brag about how good all the men look up here, and then they all left. Just like men. Anyway, um, I, um, <laughs> I got a wife and three daughters. I can't even dress myself anymore. Um, you know how you watch some of these churches and, and, and the speakers and the pastors get up and they sell you all kinds of stuff at the beginning? So let me sell you some stuff. Um, my middle daughter is running for Miss Louisiana. Ah, she is absolutely gorgeous. My name is Hollis with an S. Her name's Holly without the S. So I like to think she's one S away from being special. Um, she ran a couple of years ago, and she, out of all the contestants, she was the first loser. Um, so she finished first runner-up. But so the reason I'm telling you that if you go to my or her Facebook page, uh, she's raising money for the Children's Miracle Network, the local hospitals that help children here. And so you can help donate to Holly Conway and help her possibly win. So we can't win by looks, we'll win by money. No, I'm kidding. Anyway, uh, so, um, but look for her. Please support her. That is in June. It'll be here at ULM. All the girls from all over the state come. They do a great job. Beautiful competition. It's not just about beauty. It's a scholarship fund. They challenge those girls. They have to be intelligent. They have to know what's going on in the world. They have to be able to communicate it while in heels and a swimming suit. Anyway, so um, that's my little preview for that. My wife, I thought, would sneak in here. Are you in here? Honey, honey, said every man walking through Walmart. Honey, honey. Anyway, typical, I can't ever find her. Um, men Day, this is with men. Ladies, you can listen, but this is men stuff. You may not understand because we are incredibly complex creatures, and we think on a much higher level. So try to grab what you can, but if you can't, we'll explain it to you later, okay? It's men's day. We don't get it often. One day out of the year is ours. And we can't make it without you. We had a great time in uh, breakfast this morning. We ate pancakes and eggs and, and sausage and orange juice and milk. You know, being from the south, I was just looking for some grits. Y'all know what a grit is up here? Okay. When I travel north of the, in the country, they serve hash browns for breakfast. I don't know what's wrong with those people. Um... I am a technological guy. This is my Bible. Some people thought I was texting. I, you know, I go places like, why is he on his phone? It's the word. Um, it's digital, and it works. I can't see it, but I'm going to pretend. If I misquote a scripture, iPhone fault, not mine. Um, I want to talk about some things. I challenged the men this morning, and I want to challenge some things. I am a, I am an, I'm an athlete. I think like an athlete. Uh, 
I happen to get to speak sometime in church, and people think, well, that's a preacher. Well, I preach the word, but I'm an athlete. So I use athletic terms and terminology, and I'm used to speaking in gyms and, and auditoriums. And it's amazing. I don't know if you've ever been in our high schools. We have some really nice high schools in Washtenaw Parish in the city of Monroe. But a lot of them, when you speak into the gym, the sound systems are not always good. You get every third word, and it's like this. And sometimes they'll have kids on both sides like this, so you have to talk like this, you know. And so if you see some crazy stuff, it's out of habit, all right? Just forgive me. I apologize. Y'all are so good. Why are y'all so quiet? Y'all have to be quiet when pastor's preaching? I'm used to noise and kids getting teachers hollering, sit down, get out of here, go to the office, in the middle of my presentation. So if y'all don't say anything, I'm not going to feel at home. I want to talk about some strategies for successful living. As men, ladies, you can grab some of these things. Uh, I'm very sensitive because I have a wife and three daughters. And, and they let me know every time, it's not about you all the time. It's about us. And so, but today I want to talk about some, strate- stra- some stra- 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 strategies for successful living. I got a list and somehow I put all these S's in my message. Strategies for successful living. Strategies for successful living. Now there are only going to be three. There are probably many more, but I can only think of three and then I got distracted. All right. Strategies for successful living. The scripture I want to use today is in Jeremiah 29 11. Now this is not a prosperity message, you know, but I believe there's some good things that we can have it. That, that scripture says, one of my favorite, God says, I know the plans I have for you. So God, there's plans, and God knows them. They're his plans, and he has them for us. It's not his plans for himself. It's his plans for us. God says, I know the plans I have for you, and they're good. Now, I've made a whole lot of plans. They didn't always turn out good. Matter of fact, most of the stuff, they were good in my head, but they weren't really good when I finished uh, executing them. God's plans, they say, they're good. And not only are they good, they're designed to prosper us and to give us a hope and a future. Now, there's three things I've learned from that scripture there. God has plans. They're good. And they're going to prosper me and give me a hope and a future. Is that three? That might be five. I wasn't good in math. Um, But here's the other thing I know. You turn on the news. Any news you want. There's a whole lot of people without hope. There's a whole lot of people living plans that are not turning out for their good. There's a whole lot of people discouraged, people angry. Just any news you want. Local news, national news. Look in your community. Listen to people. There's a lot of anger and distrust and disgust and and all kinds of the ungodly things that you would never think happen in this world is happening. Just people are absolutely crazy. And all kinds of horrific events are happening in the world from mudslides to fires to tsunamis to volcanoes. All kinds of people are fighting all over the world in countries. It's amazing that I the things that are happening and you think well that's completely opposite of what God's plans are because God's plans for us were good and they're to prosper us and to give us a hope and a future and so I want to give you three things today that I think that if we do these things I think we would line up a little bit more with God's plans for us than what we're doing because obviously what we're doing is not working very well the advantage of being an athlete, and I always talk about the Olympics, the Olympics is, 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 is undescribable being a part of that event. And here's why. When you, when you go to the Olympics, you have every country in the world in one place. That's amazing. But not only do you have every country in the world in one place, you have the best of the best of the best, sir, in one place. You have the best athletes from every country in the world in every event you can imagine. You think about it from gymnasts, dream team basketball players, tennis, swimming, weightlifters, every kind of track and field. I mean, you name it, you you have the best athletes 
in the world, every shape, every size, every color, every culture, every language, every financial condition, they're coming from world powers to developing countries. We have countries where people are refugees sending the best that they have to the Olympics. You have every variety that you can imagine in one place. And they're not coming to try to be somebody else. The Russians are not trying to be Americans. The Americans are not trying to be the Chinese. The Chinese are not trying to be the African nations. Everybody, they come in and represent their country and their colors. They walk in proudly with their flag being raised and their song. And it's, it's amazing. The Olympic Village, you go in and you, you see all the world in one place. And in all of this diversity and in all of these differences, everybody seems to have very similar characteristics. Because this is what I learned. Successful people do successful things and unsuccessful people do unsuccessful things. Does that make sense? <laughs> now I'm used to being at the black church. They talk back at me. I mean, all through it. You can barely hear the preacher. I'm like, yeah, go ahead. Somebody got to make some noise in here. Um, successful people do successful things and unsuccessful people do unsuccessful things. I think part of the, the one of the biggest lies that the enemy has, has convinced the world to believe is that you can dream about being successful, you can talk about being successful, you can pray about being successful, you can quote the word about being successful, and do unsuccessful things and still think you're going to be successful. That's what the problem is. You can be any athlete in the world, he'll tell you how good he's going to be and what he's going to do. While being lazy and not doing what real successful athletes do and still think he's going to be successful. You can talk to students and talk about what kind of grades they're going to make and how they're going to pass class and how they're going to do all this stuff while not going to class and not paying attention and not doing their homework and still believe they're going to pass the class. You can talk to a whole lot of adults and talk about their dreams and what they think they're going to accomplish and everything that they're doing while not doing the stuff that it takes to accomplish those and still think that it's going to happen. You can talk to a whole lot of Christians who can talk about what God's going to do and how good God is and this and that, but not doing what God tells them to do and still think God's going to have it. <laughs> Sometimes you got to do what you're supposed to do to get what you're supposed to get. Now, I don't want to eliminate, and I don't understand the line, because God is so merciful and so graceful, and, and, and it's undeserved, his favor and mercy that he gives to us. But I don't think God wants us to lay around being lazy, doing nothing, expecting him to do all the stuff he put us here to do. Successful people will do successful things, and unsuccessful people will do unsuccessful things. Amen? Y'all learn good. So, three things. We're almost finished. We're on number one. Um, here's the first thing I think that we need to do. Uh, to be successful, we have to change the way we think. As an athlete, success is, is won here before it's here. If I don't believe I can be successful, I'm probably not going to be successful. Jumping at a bar, and I know the video, it, you can't really tell how high it is. It looks high, but you go home and look at your ceiling. Imagine running and jumping up in the air and putting your whole body over your ceiling. It looks impossible, even to me. And when I'm standing there, I'm looking at the bar, I mean, there are all kinds of thoughts that could go through your head. Most people will look at that, and their first thought is, I can't do that. My first thought is, I'm going to make that. Don't care how impossible it looks. My, I thought I could make it. And because I thought I could make it, I did the things that I needed to do to make it, and then I made it. I didn't make it the first time, didn't make it the first few times. But it's my thought that initiated the whole thing. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. Follow that? Are y'all alive? Hello? <laughs> in, in, in a lot of places, this means yes, and this means no. If you think you can't do something, you're right. If you think you can do something, you're right. 
just depends on how you're thinking. The mind is a powerful thing. The Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That means you can completely change who you are by the way you think. You can change your whole life, your whole world by the way you think. So if we don't think according to the world standards, because the world standards will often leave us frustrated and disappointed and hurt and in debt and on drugs and alcohol. I mean, the world standard will leave. If we think away according to what God says, it'll transform our life. And we can be all that God called us to be. And we can do all that God called us to do because he, he is with us. And everything in him is yes and amen. That doesn't mean you get everything you want. That means if you line up to his will, it's already done because he already gave it to you. So we need to change the way we think. I had a, um, I had a scripture on here that was pretty cool. I just thought of it. I was trying to type it. It says, um, as men, you know, because men, we fix stuff. Women, y'all need something done, we fix stuff. We may not know how to do it, but we're going to fix it. Some duct tape and a, and a hammer, we can change the world. And all of us was athletes. Pastor, even in Mr. His sermon, he couldn't miss the Hey, I ran cross country. We, had, we men, that's what we do. We conquer. Mm. We shave. Some of y'all women can shave too. But anyway, um, <laughs> I'm just being serious. Anyway, um, but it's nice that the other scripture says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to. It's amazing, with all those accomplishments and all those awards and Olympic medals, people tend to say a lot of stuff that make me feel good about myself. He did this, he did that. You win a lot of awards, you start feeling pretty good about yourself. And I start to think about, hey, I'm the man. And my wife will quickly deflate that. She's like, poop. You know you ain't take trash out. You know, you got to, you know, I would like a little bigger house. You know, when I think about, because I get this question, I'm the baby of seven kids, and I got five older sisters and a brother who did not go to the Olympics and did not have all the success I had as an athlete. And people always ask me, well, how did you get that ability to jump? Eventually, if I'm truthful, I have to say, you know what? God gave me that ability. And if God gave me that ability, all I did was be a good steward of what God gave me I can't claim all the credit for it because I didn't give myself that ability. It's about him. I'm thankful for what he gave me. Now, I did a whole lot of work, but I did a whole lot of work with something he gave me. So I don't need to think more highly of myself. I can appreciate the hard work and the accomplishment, and I can enjoy that, but ultimately, he gets the glory. I need to change the way I think. Because thinking about me being the man, uh, as I've gotten older, it only takes one question to deflate that. So how high can you jump now? <laughs> or, you know, I'm pretty good. There's a two-time Olympic medals in Hollis Conway. Hey, did you win the gold? How much money did you make? They don't pay Olympians. The football player on the bench made $38 million. The world system is a trap. You had to change the way you think and line up with him. This is in it's Philippians, I think, 1 6. Is in you I live, is in you I move, is in you I have my being. It's all about him. It's all about him. So the first thing is you got to change the way you think. Would you like to guess what the second step is? Boom! Who said that? <laughs> I would like to say this earlier. I thought I could sing. I really know I can't. So I'm sitting right here, and I'm singing my heart out. I'm like, boy, I sound good. And then I realized it wasn't you. It was you. <laughs> that was you. <laughs> I'm like, she 
sounds good. And then I caught a glimpse of my voice, and I'm like, ooh. So you can think all you want, but faith without works is dead. Eventually, you have to do what you think. You know, great athletes, when that bar is, is, is at eight feet, I can stand here and tell you, there's no doubt in my mind I thought I could make it. I know I can make it. I can do all things. I can tell you all that stuff. But you're not going to believe me until I take off running at that bar and try to make it. There's a whole lot of people that talk a good game, but there's no action that lines up with what they're saying. Yeah, I mean, we talk about faith and faith and faith, but, you know, faith without works is dead. And until you start acting out on that faith, it, nothing changes. So the second thing is we got to change what we do. Now, can I, this is tricky. Can I tell you that doing the right things can be detrimental to your success? Would you believe that? Y'all would? How? I got people just be saying, yeah. All right, so a student. You're a ULM student, right? You go to class. <laughs> That's what you say. You got to say yes in church. <laughs> <laughs> and I want you to know I'm mad at you because they were talking about you sang last Sunday and they thought I was going to sing. Well, I wasn't singing. I don't care. And then they don't know what you were saying anyway. You could have been saying anything. They don't know. Anyway, I'm picking on you. So would you believe that going to class every day, going to class on time, sitting in front and paying attention and doing your homework could all be the worst things you could do to be successful? Would anybody believe that? I can tell you a student that did all those things and failed. Because if you go to the wrong class on time and sit in the wrong class up front and do the wrong homework and listen to the wrong teacher, you're going to get an F. Because doing the right things in the wrong place is still wrong. Success is doing what God called you to do. The world is tricky. All right? And so... Unless I'm walking according to the plans and the purposes of God in my life, it doesn't matter if I'm doing all the right things in the wrong place. See, I could drive the speed limit, stay in my lane, use my blinker, and then drive in the wrong direction and end up at the wrong place. So you have to be a little bit more specific about that. It's God's plans. God says, I know the plans. It's my plans, not your plans. Many are the plans of man, but they lead to failure and frustration and disappointment. So it will behoove us to try to figure out what God's plans for our lives. See, I had a dream that I was going to be an inside linebacker for the greatest football team in the history of football, Pittsburgh Steelers. Really? Y'all some haters. Mean Joe Green. Jack White, Jack Ham, Star Wars, Swan, Terry Bradshaw. We have the only biblical play in the history of the world, the Immaculate Reception. The greatest commercial ever with Mean Joe Green and the Sprite. And I wanted to be a linebacker. And I went out for football in high school, and the coach looked at me and said, go home. I wasn't even good enough to get cut from the football team. The worst thing that could have happened in my life is that I would have fulfilled my dreams and spent my life as a third-string football player instead of a world-class high jumper because that was not God's plans for my life, to play football. There's nothing wrong with playing football. There's a lot of value in playing football. A whole lot more money in playing football. But God called me to be the high jumper. So I could have went to football and did all of the same training that I put in for track and field and missed the boat. There are people who spend all their life climbing a ladder of success and get to the top and realize they climbed the wrong ladder. We have to change what we do to line up with what God wants us to do. And a lot of that is built around our personality, our skill set, our family, our genetics. So I talk a lot about this because I get to go to a lot of places and speak. And I was just sharing with the men this morning, 
you know, my schools in Washita Parish, I had 26 schools in Washita Parish. Might be more, but I mean, but if you think about this, if I went private, I could go Northeast Baptist, Claiborne Christian, Grace Episcopal, OCS, St. Fred's, River Oaks. Am I missing something? But then I could go south. I got uh, Carroll Junior High, Carroll High School. You got MLK Wasman. You got Richwood Junior High. You got Richwood. You have Washtenaw Junior High, East Washita, Washita High School. You got Sterlington Junior High, Sterlington. You got Good Hope, West Ridge, West Monroe High School. You got Calhoun and um, uh, with the R, um, Riser and West Washita. Uh, and I forgot, you have Start in the middle of nowhere. Start Isles. You have all these schools, but not only are these schools different, they're in different communities with different people. Different income levels, different culture, different racial backgrounds. They're all different, but they make up Washington Parish. Did I say Lee and Neville? <laughs> Leah Neville. I forgot Leah Neville. How do you forget Leah Neville? Um, and I'm only naming middle schools and high schools. There's a million elementary schools. I can't even keep up with the elementary schools. But they all make up Washita Parish. So we're one parish, but what makes us great is that each part brings who they are and add to it. So we're not asking those kids. I remember the first time I went to West Washita when I found my way out there. And this is back when I got here. And I don't think I stopped seeing black people when I got through Calhoun. And I drove up to the school, and everybody had trucks with big wheels on them. And they were all dirty. The whole parking lot. What a clean truck. And I walk in the gym, and I'm looking for a coach, and I'm expecting to see people playing basketball or badminton or dodgeball or something. I can't find anybody. And I'm like, where is everybody? They're in the room, and I go in the room, every kid had camouflage on, and they're watching videos of people killing animals, getting certified so that they can go kill animals. And they're all happy, and kids showing me pictures of dead animals they kill. And I'm from the city, and I'm just terrified. I'm like, oh, they get stuff hanging and stuff, and they're just so much pride in their life, you know. And I'm like, oh, God, where am I? We got Duck Dynasty, for goodness sake. I'm like, what in the world? I wouldn't step in that water. The culture different. And I go from there, and I go drive to, to, to Richwood. That's a whole nother world. And so I, I, I always enjoy the different cultures and earning the food that they eat. I don't eat it, but I mean the different foods that they eat and the, and the way this, you know, I mean, coming from South Louisiana, let me tell you something. I don't, you may hate the cage and this and that, but let me tell you something. You get some good gumbo or jambalaya or some etouffee, you know, they put the cayenne pepper in there before they cook it. That food is smoking. You get that little twinge back here, boy, you're like, whoa, that's some good stuff. You know, this is how my wife cook, all right? So she, she, she's smothering some pork chops. I'm way off subject, but I'm hungry. <laughs> so um, you season the meat. You put that red pepper on there, and you rub it in, and some Tony Tetris, and, and you rub all that in and stuff, and you put some grease in the frying pan, and you put that meat in, and you go, and then you pour water in there, and you let that thing simmer till the meat gets soft and all that stuff, and that grease is your gravy. Man, I came up here and they cooked me some pork chop. That grease was so, I mean, that gravy was thick and brown. They had used flour and water and some black pepper. And it was good. <laughs> but it was different. It's just different cultures. And you, you have to appreciate all that. What we tend to do is think what we have is the greatest thing in the world. And unless you do it my way, you're wrong. But if we're going to be who God called us to be, men and women, if we're going to be the body of Christ, the world should see who we are and be drawn to him. If who we are is repelling people because most of the time we think they wrong, then we're not being who God called. We need to change what we do to line up with who he is so that he gets the glory. Not our party, not our school district, 
not our church, not our neighborhood, not our ideology. What we do must line up with who he is. All right? So now we're almost finished. We're down to number three already. Number three might take an hour, you know. You know what it means when a black preacher look at his watch? Nothing. <laughs> Don't get excited. <laughs> this is not Brother Smith up here. <laughs> I'm just joking. Anyway, what are we talking about? Um, so, change the way we think. Change what we do. It's important you do it in that order because if you start changing what you do before you change what you think, you might not be doing what you think you're doing. <laughs> Does that make sense? All right. Um, so, oh, I love this one. Oh, this is good. I'm preaching to myself. I lost it. We need to finish the race. I think you who read that scripture earlier. We need to finish the race, which means we have to commit to the process. Success takes time. Most people dream of going to the Olympics. A lot of kids dream of going to the Olympics, and it may take 8, 10, 15 years. But let's say you even at the beginning of the process, the Olympics are every four years, so you at least get four years of planning. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, hey, you know what, I think I want to go to the Olympics, and I'm just going to go the next day. You know, I... I I should have learned this. I heard them say this, but the most powerful force on earth is something called compounding interest. You start, if you start saving early, by the time you get to retirement age, you got a whole lot of money left to live on. I wish I'd have learned that because, I mean, I spent my money um, on pageant stuff, but you're going to help me, so that's good. Anyway, um, success takes time. But do, do you know that it is so much easier to start something than it is to finish it? I mean, we at the beginning of the year, and a lot of us had New Year's resolutions that we didn't blew up already. We ain't even out of January. <laughs> we ain't finished. Y'all ever heard of this exercise program called P90X? It's, it's, it's 90 days of training. I've been trying to finish P90X for eight years. I've gotten as close as 80 days and missed a a couple of days that turned into two months. I can go good for a while, but I have not. It is so much easier to start something. I mean, we got faith. Yeah, I'm going to commit to doing this. I'm doing it. But boy, over time, it gets lost in the shuffle. But we got to finish the race. Let me tell you this. How you finish says more about your character than how you started. You think about all the social media stuff. We're always posting stuff that we're going to do. I mean, it looks good. I'm so proud of you. You're doing so good. But you don't really see any of those posts after we didn't quit. Nobody really posting that stuff. Girl, I couldn't make it. Ooh, it got hard. I'm sorry. I got to live with women. <laughs> Child. Ooh. Diets. You know, people think I'm skinny. On that video, I was 142 pounds. Max. I was six foot, 142 pounds. I'm 199 pounds now. And most people say, that don't look bad, but that's 50 extra pounds. So you add 50 pounds to you and see how you feel. Well, boy, I tell you what, I've almost decided, so that's what I be thinking. I ain't eating right. That's nasty. My wife be bringing food home. Like, you know, she not in here, is she? You, we live streaming this? Oh, man. <laughs> I love my wife. She's the greatest thing ever. But <laughs> you recording it? <laughs> we moving. Anyway, um, I'm already brown. I don't want everything in my house to be brown. Brown bread, brown spaghetti, brown rice, brown, everything brown. I'm like, man, I'd be glad when we get past this. About two, three weeks later, boy, be cookies and cream, ice cream in the house. <laughs> Whole milk. Yes. And we'd be like doing good and like, whoa, whoa, it's hard. But can I tell you how you finish says a whole lot more about your character than how you start. We need to be people 
who finish. The world is looking at us. And you know why the world is laughing at, laughing at Christians? Because we start off preaching all this stuff about God, and over time, if they watch us longer, they realize, they say, they don't even believe it. I think the divorce rate for Christians is pretty close to the divorce rate for non-Christians. We don't finish too strong in marriage when the Bible says, hey, we're going to stand right before God and say, I'm going to commit to marry you to death do us part. For in sickness and health, for richer and poor, I'm going to do all this stuff. Hey, man, irreconcilable differences. Can you separate us? The world is looking at us, and we, we, we start all this stuff, and they said, they ain't going to finish. But if we finish strong, it would, it would be totally different. Bless you. Not how you start the race. You know, if you start the race, the gun go up, pow, and you start running and you don't finish, you don't even get a place. You know, they'll have, they'll have first through eighth place, and if you were the ninth runner in there, you don't even get a place. You get a did not finish. We need to finish strong. I believe in the power of God to heal, to deliver, to provide for, to, to do all exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ever think or ask. I believe in God to do all that stuff. But in order to finish strong, God is saying, you need to do what I call you to do. You need to be obedient to me. You need to trust me. You need to allow me to do those things in your life. I think what we miss up, that when I said we need to change what we do, we think to do means that we have the power to do it. But it's in him we live and in him we move. And it's his power that works in us to do uh, of his good pleasure. It's all about him. And if we, are, if we submit, see, it's different from the world. We submit and trust God to work in us and to guide us and to lead us and to help us. Now, we got to move. We got to walk by faith. And when we fall down, he'll pick us up. And when we're running too fast, he'll slow us down. He'll remind us he's right there. He will encourage us and say, hey, I love you. You can do it. Hey, stop it. You're it. If you don't do that, this is going to happen. We have to, we, we have to do those things. God will fix finish the race for us. God will help us finish because he's there before us. He's there at the beginning. He's in the middle. He's all around. He's, other, he's everywhere. And, but we have to trust him enough that he's going to bring us to the end. We have to run the race. We have to fight the fight. But we have to keep the faith. They all go together. We got to finish strong. And I would like to say to you, that if you make up your mind at the beginning that you're going to finish, you got a much better chance of finishing than not even thinking about anything. See, I already know my wife and I, we, we've been married long enough for me to, because I paid attention, that when she says, let's go to the mall, we're only going to be going to one store. That means we're there all day. I've made up my mind that I'm going to be there all day because one of the things that we, I get mad about the most is that I don't like that she's going to look at everything on the rack knowing she's not going to buy anything on the rack. And we'll try stuff on. And I'm sitting there going, oh, I'm sitting there looking at the other man over there like, we don't even say anything. I just look at him and he look at me and we know exactly. Like, man, I know. Stores start putting little benches in corners for men to just sit on while the women shop. So I made up my mind at the beginning what's going to happen so that I'm not mad and we have this argument, but I've made it up. At the, there have been times where we left the house and I wasn't thinking right and I didn't make up my mind and we ended up somewhere and I'm like, I'm just mad. See, if you, if you know from the beginning and you, and you commit to the end, you're more likely to finish than just one. If you get up in the morning and you meditate on the Word of God and the Word of God, He will guide you throughout the day and help you finish through the day. But if you don't, the world is going to put all kinds of stuff in your head and get you thinking crazy, and you're going to end up quitting, frustrated. There's a whole lot of people, Pastor talked about it in the Bible study, who they talked about assisted suicide, helping people go because people have made up in their mind that they want to quit. But if we're in the Word of God, there is no quitting. It doesn't matter how old you are, as long as you're breathing, God can use you and do great things in your life and use you to touch people and to make a difference. But you got to know that from the beginning. How you finish says a whole lot more about your character than how you end. So I'm going to give you these scriptures and then we'll close out. I'm going to share one story and then we'll call Pastor back, back up. Because finishing is hard. I hate when great athletes come talk to kids and say, you know what, if you just believe and you work hard, it'll happen. Success is hard. 
There's not many people who are gonna who dream of going to the Olympics gonna go to the Olympics. There's not many people who want to play in the NFL. They're gonna work really hard gonna get to the NFL. It, that, things happen. But it's biblical. Listen to what God says in Romans 5 3. One of my favorite scriptures it says, We glory in our tribulation because it produce because we know that tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character hope. We glory in our tribulations. We're happy about hard stuff. How many of y'all are happy about hard stuff? Hard classes, hard relationships, hard people, hard jobs. Anybody happy about that stuff? What? World class athletes look forward to the hardest workout they can do because they know that if I get through this workout, it's going to produce perseverance. Do you know that you can't ask God for perseverance? God's not going to give you perseverance. Lord, please help me persevere. Perseverance is not something you get. Perseverance is something you experience. In order to get in shape running, you have to run. You're not going to be in shape asking God to help you get in shape. You got to run. But in order to get endurance, you have to run past the point to where you feel like you can't run. If you run to where you can't go anymore and stop and rest, and you start running, you're still at square one. In order to go further to get in endurance, you have to endure. So you run, and so if you run and you can't go no more and you take one step further, you realize, I can go one step further. And one step further today equals one step further tomorrow. And one step further tomorrow, and at the end of the week, you're five more steps down the road than you, from everybody else who quit because they couldn't go any further. And you keep doing that, and you realize you can do it. Y'all ever heard of something called a second win? You running, and they, people say, I caught my second win. You know you only get your second win when you run out of your first win. Most people run out of their first win, rest, and catch up so they can stay on their first win. But you only get your second win by keep running. And that happens with people who've made up in their mind that I'm not going to quit. I know it hurts. I know it's hard. I know I feel like my body is not going to make it. But I got one more step. And so they glory that because it produces perseverance. From that perseverance, it produces character. Because you only get character by hanging in there long, long enough to know that, hey, God made me through here. I can make it through tomorrow. That's the only way you get character. Character says, you know what? I've been there before. I knew that. The world's not going in. My God's got me. If I hang in here long enough, I know I can make it. When I get to the end of my rope, I'm going to tie a knot and hang on. Because the only other option is to let go and fall. That's how you get character. You hang in there long enough to see God come through just like he said. If you stop, you don't ever know. And that character gives you a real hope, a hope that will not disappoint, because that hope is built on him. So I love that scripture, Romans 5, 3, we glory in our tribulation because it produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. Look at 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Can't be scared. Can't be scared. God has given you power, love, and a sound mind. John 17, 15 says, I do not pray that you take them out of the world. I get a whole lot of people saying, Brother, can you pray for me, man? I don't want to go through it. Can you pray for me? I'm like, God, no, nah, I don't pray. To, uh, who said that? Tim, I, I do not pray that you take him out, John. I do not pray that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from evil. Some tribulation, some pain, some frustration, we need to experience because it's going to make us better on the other side. We're going to learn. We're going to be people of character. We need to learn to discipline and go through it. I, I hate to see it. Can you imagine an athlete with all the talent in the world who never wants a hard workout? It's not going to produce what it needs to. So sometimes I don't pray that people, uh, that the situation disappear. I pray that God strengthen them so that his will can be done in that situation. We're not going to, we don't save the world. God does the saving. We just need to love people. We can't fix everybody's problem. But we can love people. And, and they can learn that God will love them in that situation. and they can make it out. And so that's important. And the last one I will read to you is Luke 10, 19. It says, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. 
God is, God is more powerful than anything that could ever come against my life. And when I'm in a tough situation, I can depend on him and his word to get me through that situation. But I don't even, I don't even pray that I get through the situation. I just pray to God, whatever you want me to do while I'm in that situation, I do that so that you can get the glory. And so nothing that the world, I don't fear, you know, a lot of people saying, you know, if Trump does this and Obama did that and if the senator does this, and then I don't fear about all of that stuff. That stuff didn't, I don't lose one bit of sleep over any of that. I don't argue with people. I don't fuss with people because I trust God. And I'm worried about doing what God called me to do in the situation that he has me in with the people that he wants me to talk to. And I can just love people. And I can sleep at night. He's given us that ability. We're not defeated. We're more than, not only are we conquerors, we're more than conquerors in him. And so I want to share this story as I get Pastor to, to come up. I don't want to lose my, my iPhone. That's an iPhone 10 there. Y'all might need your phones when you go to Holly's page and donate to CMN. And, um, <laughs> I have a house I need to sell. So if anybody's looking for a home, it's a lovely home. We would love for you to buy it. Anyway, um, when I went to the Olympics in 1988, my mom went with me. No, my dad went with me to the first Olympic. And it was cool because we didn't have all the crazy stuff that's happening in the world now. The security was a little bit more lax. So when my dad came, he got to hang out in the village. And he got official Olympic clothing. You know, you can go to the Academy and Dick's and all those places and buy the USA Olympic stuff. My dad got the real stuff. And he hung out with real Olympians. He hung out in the village. And he was just talking to the Olympians and, and going where we went. He would eat where we eat, and he would do all those things. Well, in 92, my mom gets to go, but my mom thinks she's everybody's mama. You know how mamas used to take their spit and, and clean? I'm like, mama, you don't know them. They don't even speak English. She's trying to be everybody's mama. So she's hanging out at the Olympics, and she's wearing Olympic stuff, and she's just, I mean, just everybody mama. But when it came time for us to line up for the opening ceremony to go in the stadium, my mom and dad, who looked like Olympians, who wore what Olympians wore, who did what Olympians did, who kind of thought like Olympians, said what we said, they would not let them in the stadium. You know why? They weren't on the team. <clears throat> I want to share this with you. You can look like a Christian. You can sing what Christians sing. You can read the Christian Bible. You can come to church like Christians. You can do all that stuff. But unless you accept that Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're not on the team. None of this stuff works without him. What foolishness would it be to gain the whole world and lose your soul? You have to believe that Jesus Christ came and died and rose again to be on the team. The Bible says that we've all fallen short. And the penalty of that is eternal separation from him. But the gift of God is eternal life. That if you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. For with your heart you believe unto righteousness, and with your mouth confession is made unto salvation. You have to make a decision. And not because you had some eloquent speaker come or the music was so good. It's, not about, it's about God speaking to your heart. He does the drawing. You have to respond to what he's doing in your heart. You have to make a conscious decision. So many times with FCA, because we, we want the Spirit of God, and so we set it up, and we, we have the right speakers, and we have the right music, and, and the right lighting, but we found out that a lot of people responded to that stuff instead of the voice of God. So as pastors come up, I want to I encourage you to search your heart to see if you really made that decision. That decision was based on a call of God, or that decision was based on other circumstances or factors. And whatever he asks you to do, make that decision. Today is today. I'm not a fear monger, but really, tomorrow not promised to any of us. Shouldn't be a reason you make that decision, but the reality is, don't think you have a whole lot of time. Respond to God's call. Make that decision. It's the first and the best decision you'll ever make in your life. Amen? And Hollis has already shared how, what you do to, to be saved. You're here and you've never trusted the Lord. We invite you to come and make public that commitment. 
because that is the most important decision of life. As we stand to sing our hymn of invitation, you come as we sing. If you're already a Christian and God's leading you to make a commitment of some kind, you come. Moving your membership to go to work with God's people here, rededicating your life, whatever it might be. You may even feel led to come to the altar and pray. If you do, you come. Our deacons lead the way there, but you come as well. Let God have his way as we sing together. Let him have his way in your life. This is the most important part of the entire service, that opportunity for you to commit to Jesus, to do what he's leading you to do with your life. bow together she continues to play when you come even now if all is well in your heart you pray for someone else but make sure first of all that you're doing what God wants you to be doing with your life We do thank you for your presence this morning, and Hollis, thank you for coming to share with us as well. And uh, she's going to be taking some pictures down front, so if you want to speak to him, you hang around down front. I'm going to be at the back door, though, all right? Huh? And Sharon's going to be at the other door to uh, cover that one. But we're glad you're here. Pray for Hollis and the new work that he's involved in and uh, that God will use him there at ULL. <coughs> they need it a lot, don't I mean... <laughs> <laughs> the raging Cajuns. Anyway, we pray, pray for him as he continues to minister and to let God use him in a special way. Hope you'll be back tonight for our uh, January Bible study. The adults will be meeting in the fellowship hall. It starts at 5 o'clock. We have a great time of fellowship as well as studying God's word. We'll be in First Peter as we're continuing that. So we invite you to come. There's a place for every member of the family, so bring them all. And choir practice will be at four here in the auditorium. So you join uh, the choir and come come sing. The, the regular choir will be here. But any of you guys that want to continue to come, you come. Boy, we'll add the chairs. We'll just fill it on up and keep, keep adding. Let's bow together for our closing prayer and, and truly pray for one another that God's will will be done in each of our lives in a special way. Charlie, leave, lead us, please, sir. <laughs> 